Well, hey there, everyone. I am here with who I feel like is my friend. <laughs> I was just telling him back backstage. I feel like I know him because I watch his stuff all the time. Oh, but Ted is talking. What now, Ted? He said, yes, we're friends so far. <laughs> so far. Okay, fantastic. But this is none like other. To something in reserve. <laughs> yes, yes. None other than Bart K. And Bart, uh, what happened was I went carnivore sort of accidentally about a year and a half ago after starting with keto and then just like broccoli sounded disgusting. So I just ate ribeyes um, and then come to find out through people uh, like yourself, like Dr. Barry and Dr. Anthony Chafee, that this is actually the best way we can be eating. And then I did something really crazy and started my own YouTube channel. And so I have some questions for you because when you have a YouTube channel, you do stuff like do live streams with fellow people in the space and then people watching will ask questions. Um, and as long as it's something about my own experience, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good with it. Uh, but sometimes I really don't know what the answer is. And so I've compiled some of these questions and figured I would ask somebody a lot more expert than I am. And are you game? I'll try anything once. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so my first set of question comes from people who haven't uh, started Carnivora yet, and they have maybe some objections. Um, and so one that I've heard is that meat can be very hard on the kidneys. And I kind of know, like, well, no, it isn't, but I don't really know why it isn't. Can you explain that? I think the first port of call is that when somebody makes a positive claim, this is related to that in a causal way. This causes that. It's actually you that's entitled to be the one that's demanding of any evidence of that rather than you having to provide evidence that it's not so. Hmm. And that's probably the first starting framework for every discussion I have about what the science says, because the science doesn't say a great deal of anything very good about many things because there's a lot of rubbish that goes on under the guise of science. I know I was in it for two decades as, as a contributing author to that body of work that's called the peer-reviewed literature. And yeah, I can tell you some horror stories from there if you like. But yeah, so... With that in mind, what you would need to do is if you wanted to test that hypothesis, given the lack of ability to actually do experimental science, what we would have to do is find a population of people who eat pretty much nothing but meat and animal fat and no plant material, carnivores, 100% carnivores, and compare them in some way to a so-called otherwise matched paired cohort of people who do the opposite. Otherwise, what are you comparing with what? The difficulty is getting all of these different degrees of freedom lined up so that you can say these are two comparable subsets of human beings. Because there are so many threads through this tapestry in terms of a person's health outcomes. And given that ethics committees are dead set against locking people in labs for extended numbers of decades to test out health hypotheses, so that the science in this area is pretty weak. Anywho, so, that said, there's there's no evidence. Yeah. You're quite right. There's no evidence that it is. So that's the answer. Okay. Mm. Um, and then another one that I get a lot is, well, I'm fill in the blank culture. Like a specific one I've heard is, well, I I'm Filipino for an example. In my culture, we eat a lot of rice, and I just can't give up the rice. It's part of my culture. Mm. So is that is there something to be said for that? Have they, you know, how how does that work? Because they're kind this, of really Yeah, I think that person needs to hand in their card immediately to <laughs> Ted. Um, and they need to front up for public naming and shaming. We'll point at them and laugh and say you never really were a carnivore and you did it wrong. Um, no. Look, carnivore strictly means any amount of meat in the diet. An animal that eats meat is a carnival. So any. Then they've got this thing that they call hyper carnival, which is any animal that eats more than 70% of meat and fat. That's a hyper carnival. And then there's this 
human invention called 100% carnivore, which is kind of more like an ideal than what I teach and not an actual target. Because humans actually don't do best at 100, 100 necessarily. It might be that there are small diversions from that in terms of some plant material. That person's genes over many generations are associated with the intake of rice. Yes. So there'll be some adaptation to that. Some, I'm going to call it tolerance to it because I'm quite convinced that the seeds of pretty much any plant are not good health-wise, long-term for a human being. That's an opinion based on my understanding of physiology. Notice I'm not going to tap a study that says, and here's a study that proves it, because I know there isn't one. As distinct from people that sort of sing off a different song sheet to me that always like to say, here's a study that proves, a study that I could pull to bits probably within two minutes because I know the tricks so yeah. I know that's a long answer but yeah no that's good um so you're saying that then that that's not really a like it, it would still be better for them to start eating more meat and just keep their rice in is that what you're saying or or not or not well I think a person will know what's best for them n equals one mm -hmm. playing around n equals one a bit within reason so I might suggest to that person that they might try a short-term trial, say three to six months of halving the rice and eating to satiety otherwise from other sources, so long as other sources are meat and fat and not other vegetables added in. See how you feel. Is that better? Is there an improvement in your body composition, your energy, your affect? the way you interact with the universe at large. Is this a better thing? If it is, then don't fix it. If it's worse, then it, experiment fail. I guess N equals one. Because everything is on a bell-shaped curve and there are always outliers on any curve and this given person, be they Filipino or not, might be one of those people. So all comments have to be you know, considered to be if you are average Jack or average Jill. Mm -hmm. So then what about those? So I've seen just in my time on YouTube, I guess I've seen people that have decided to add carbs back in. And usually once they do, it becomes more and more like they'll start off. I'm going to go back to 20. And then before you know it, it's 50 and then it's a mm -hmm. hundred. And some of these people do say that they feel better, that their sleep improved, that their satiety improves. Um, and I just, for myself personally, I know that that would, I mean, I haven't tried adding them back in, but I know how I felt before. And I was always hungry um, and always worried about, you know, wh where's my next meal coming from? Um, mm. And now that I eat mostly meat, you're right. I'm not hundred percent. I still do drink decaf coffee <laughs> and I might have What's the occasional the pickle. <laughs> What's the point if it's decaf? Goodness gracious. Because <laughs> I just I just turned the caffeine switch off about three weeks ago and I'm I'm hanging on. <laughs> okay. Good luck. So with that. anyway, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> um uh but anyway, they're saying things like their satiety has improved, their sleep has improved hmm. uh by adding these carbs back in. And I was wondering what your thoughts were. I know for me, you said it n equals one. My n equals one would be no, probably right. not. Well, here's his I think a interaction of possibilities. This will be a theory again. This is not something I can I can point to a study on, but let's just use an analogy. Let's say you've got a ward full of uh, heroin addicts strapped to beds for their own safety, and they can't sleep because they're all in withdrawal from their heroin. You could put them all to sleep soundly like children within seconds by going and giving each one of them a hit, couldn't you? And carbohydrate addiction is real, and it's as powerful as heroin addiction, I'm told. So, yes, they might sleep better because now they're subserving the reptile brain and they're doing the thing that makes that addictive 
things happy and so there's the dopamine reward and so that kicks on with the melatonin serotonin axes etc all theory all of that but i think that's probably a reasonable theory but doesn't mean that that's a good thing because maybe they need to ride that out to get clean also yeah. theory <laughs> Okay, and then I wanted to pick your brain a little bit about seed oils. When I first came into carnivore, keto carnivore, I knew nothing about seed oils, that they were bad, nothing. Then I started, like I said, watching different um, influencers and, and learning about them. Most that I've heard talk will tell you that they're very bad for you. Um, I've still heard a couple say that the jury's still out and that the science on that is weak. Um, so I figured who better to ask than you? Right. Okay. So I can talk a bit from the reductionist end of it, the, this and that, this causing that and all of this, the, the basic sciences. And we can make statements of fact without fear of contradiction that both MUFA and PUFA is vastly more apt to become oxidized than is a saturated fatty acid molecule. That is a fact. Ergo, it would be reasonable to suggest that in practice that in fact does occur. And to test that hypothesis, all we need to do is take a sample from some people and subject it to the right kind of analysis to determine what kind of oxidation has gone on. And that will answer that question for us. And the answer seems to be that it's possible to produce samples from people that have quite high levels of very, very dangerous primary and secondary oxidation products. So that's almost certainly not a good thing. Can I point to a study that says, and in practice, we can see this leading cause and effect to a disease process in humans? No, because ethics committees don't like that kind of study. So we can't do that. But that's as close as we can get from that end. Furthermore, we have, we, the scientific community, have identified a number of histologies where you'll find PUFAs have become inveigled into things like cell membranes where it should be a saturated fat chain off that. And because they do that, that messes up the arrangement of the fatty acids in that membrane, thus causing its function to become compromised. Never a good thing. And these things have also been found chemically bound to DNA, which would derange that DNA and potentially cause all sorts of things up to it, including maybe carcinogenesis, all theories. But all reasons to go, well, what's our exact dietary requirement for mono and polyunsaturates? There are one or two essentials on either side of that list. Essentials, ones you have to take in at some level. But I've yet to come across a human being that isn't meeting those requirements. So maybe don't add any mono or polyunsaturates. People say monos are great. Olive oil is great, they'll say. It's anti-inflammatory. True, if it's pure, actual olive oil. But when you buy a bottle of olive oil, number one, is it really olive oil? Did you read the label carefully? And is it telling you the truth? And actually, olive oil is... 16 to 18 percent polyunsaturates so they're still there and in numbers vastly more than you would get from say eating some red meat and associated fat which does have some polyunsaturates in it inherently um so again a bit a bit long-winded but there it is is that because of the way that they're made seed oils i think you know, it, yeah, well processing I think seed oils probably are such a problem, not necessarily because of manufacturing, but purely because of what they are chemically. Um, and that leads to a direct traceable series of interactions like I've just outlined, none of which seem to point in a health-promoting direction, it would seem, based on what we understand about physiology. So I would, I mean, and given the very, very near, well, the near zero need for the intake of either, I would just get them out of your diet. 
Yeah, that, that I did that almost. Yeah. Go on. I was just going to say, I did that almost right away but as soon as I heard how, how bad they could be. But I heard mm. that also the half-life is so long that I've still got a few more years to wait, right? Yeah, there's there's a half-life of these inveigled polyunsaturates in these membranes that I was talking about. And it can take a couple of years to half the value that it is, whatever it is now. So, yeah, it's it's a while to get to get clear, your system clean and get all this... Mm all this stuff out of your out of your system. The other thing that we haven't mentioned is that polyunsaturates directly upregulate the activity of two of the pro-inflammatory pathways, cause and effect, um, whereas monounsaturates generally upregulate just the one. So, but still inflammatory, even though they claim it to be anti-inflammatory. Yeah, they do. They for sure do. Um, would there be symptoms I could potentially notice or is it just kind of going on in the background and is going to cause problems later on for me personally if for example i'm 48 right no you're not no. don't be silly <laughs> oh. i won't have it <laughs> um of course i have to um go back to reminding me of the question is what we have to do completely lost the thought Oh, would that be something? Would that be symptoms that I could notice oh, yes, symptoms. right My now? Apologies. Or is it something that's going to happen in 20 yes. years if I, you know what I'm saying? Got it. Yes. Symptoms and all of that. You'll have to excuse the muddle and the muddle. We're moving house soon, but there you go. Okay. So symptoms could really be anything that would indicate that cell membranes, for example, are not being formed very well. Like it could be bad skin, bad hair, bad nails, at the very light end of it. And as it builds up, you've got more and more dysfunction. There'll be more and more symptomology that develops along those lines. You might notice nothing because it's a gradual onset thing. But if a scientist took a sample from your person and analysed it, they would be able to tell you how much of this is going on wouldn't be cheap, but you could get that done. Yeah. Probably yeah. on a teacher's salary, that's not going to happen. Mm. <laughs> we elementary teachers are not known for our money. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it's a matter of getting on the right path, trusting that you're now on the right path and yeah. um, waiting the time for you to serve, whatever that is, for whatever penance you need to serve for, I guess. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. Um. Okay. So I've heard people talk about adding fruit back into their diet. A lot of people, if they're going to add something back in, that's one of the things they start with. And one yeah. of the, first of all, I often feel like those people feel the need to defend that. <laughs> like mm. they're defending that to those of us that aren't currently doing that. Dude, um, it's so good for you, dude. <laughs> right, right, yeah. right. Um, and one of the things I hear is that it's because the fruit even though there's fructose in the fruit, but it comes with fiber though. And so the fiber mm. is going to mitigate that and it's mm. going to not cause a problem for me if I eat this fruit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If anything, the evidence regarding fiber and colonic function at the actual functional end of assessments, the actual looking at how people's colons Free living actual human beings colons how they operate according to fiber um there's one study that we know about that had n equals 62 or n equals 63 or something and they were people who presented with idiopathic constipation and they found well they had four groups of people and they said, okay, you people eat the same as what you've been eating. You people increase your fiber by 25% or something. Don't quote me on that, but this is just an idea of the design. And the, another group had to reduce theirs by 50%. And a final group had all of the fiber withdrawn completely from their diet. And they followed them for X number of weeks. And there was a dose response reduction and idiopathic constipation, stress and strain, bloating, anal bleeding, any of that kind of stuff. The less fiber was in the diet, the less of those things persisted in those idiopathic sufferers. To the point where in the group where they removed all the fiber, every single one of them had complete remission. 
so that's the only kind of pseudo experimental style thing that exists in humans and it was pretty emphatic that people with a problem tended to clear that problem up when they removed what was apparently the cause of that problem so there there it is fiber was really not good for gut function secondly you don't mitigate the effect of fructose which has a direct effect on your atp level you can't mitigate that by throwing fiber at yourself even if it was good for your gut which it still isn't so both of those arguments are not going to fly Yes, when you take in fructose, it directly drags the level of ATP down. Which means that you're going to start piling in more and more and more to try and catch up and you're just going to get further and further behind. It's the very mechanism by which bears get themselves fat for the winter when there are some berries around. Well, that's true. Um, but what about the microbiome? Isn't fiber so good for the microbiome? She asked sarcastically. <laughs> yeah. The microbiome is a thing we know less about than the surface of the planet Mars, in fact. There is a lot of speculation out there. There's a lot of um, people pontificating about the microbiome as if there was just one kind and how it should be and what shape it should take and all of that without actually visiting the first fundamental logic, which was why don't we look at some healthy people and see what kind of microbiome they've got. And they say, oh, well, we have done, and it's it's diverse. And, and then we just take that to mean in any one given individual? No, it meant people's microbiota were very different, depending on geographically where they are, where they are on the planet in terms of the latitude, the time of year, all sorts of stuff. The diet, obviously. So there was all these different, I mean, Diverse. So now we go, oh, diversity is the key then. So we need a we need a, a varied microbiota. So we need to eat from the rainbow, because I was just thinking last week about how deficient I am in the color pink. You know, um, and all this other stuff that would logically make sense and that we would accept emotionally with ease, because you talk about balance. Now we evoke the image of the lady with the scales and the blindfold and justice and light and everything that's good. And of course we should have balance. No, we're a specialist. We've evolved in a specialist niche just like any other animal. Our particular niche is hypercarnivore, which I defined earlier. Human beings throughout history, actually up until the agrarian revolution, were 80-20 animal products and plant material. And the 20% wasn't tons and tons of fruit or juices or any of that. Yeah. It was rooty fibrous things that weren't even starchy because they hadn't been selectively bred for yet. These were things that we could subsist on when the mammoth hunt was unsuccessful or whatever. Okay. Yeah. I was going to ask you about the 20%. So that 20% was subsistence food when there wasn't meat around. Yes. That's right. Yeah. That's what it would seem because there wasn't much actual nutrition to be had. What you could get from that as a human, is a very small amount of short-chain fatty acids derived by fermentation of some of that fiber in the gut. Whatever that fiber would be destroying the function of that gut while it's there, apparently, according to that one study. And I suggest humans did that either when they weren't successful and had to subsist as a group for a while that way. And I suspect probably the women ate more of that too while they waited at own base don't know that's just a speculation as well so another thing i've heard about fiber is when you're trying to lose weight though can't fiber help you just to feel full so you don't eat as much isn't wouldn't that be a good idea you could do the same thing with sawdust if you like it would probably have a very slightly less damaging immediately effect on your gut than the equivalent amount of actual sawdust if you did eat sawdust but not much it seems that fiber is really, really not good stuff in your gut. It really doesn't help in any way. Um, if you have a problem with hunger signaling, it's probably because your metabolic pathways are all out of whack and probably your hormones are all up the pole as well. And it's probably because you believed them when they said to you that you should have a balanced diet and balances peace and light and everything that's good. 
No, you're a specialist, you're a hypercarnivore. All those carbohydrates have done messed you up. Mm. Okay, well then what about fermented foods? There are some people in our space, carnivore space, um, talking about fermented foods as either just something they like to add or even as something that's very beneficial. Right. If you mean fermented plant material, then yes. Yes, I do. Not, not yeah, me. Yeah. Right. Fermented and or plants. dairy products. Yeah, yeah. Or And or yeah. dairy products, yeah. Mm, yeah. Okay. So um, there are those who do profess that they feel better on having some of this in their diet as a probiotic, they call it. Which is crazy because everything you eat is a probiotic, isn't it? Of course it is. There's nothing special about food that you've begun breaking down and fermenting uh, before you eat it. It makes it more available and more easy for your body to get what it can out of it. But it doesn't probably change hugely what's in it other than maybe lowering the sugar level. don't know. It's, it's just one of those things that... I've never seen a demonstrated benefit, not in myself and not in anybody else either, but there are those that would swear by it. And I'll say, well, okay, it's that L-shaped curve. Not everyone fits in the middle thing. Okay, that's fine with me. Um, the only time I would object publicly to people making statements about what is good and whatever is if they go beyond the, this was good for me, to I can now tell you about what's good for everybody and be all authoritative about it and say things that are just silly like you you must have carbohydrates in your diet they'll say because if you don't your brain won't work mm. and you'll die basically is what they're saying oh good well now you've just told us you know everything about physiology no mm. So that's that was the perfect segue to my next question. Did you read my question list? I did not. No, I haven't. No, I didn't. <laughs> if you sent them to me, I didn't. Um, right. No, I didn't. I was no, I didn't. I was okay. a bad interviewer. I did not send you a questions ahead of time. You should see them. They're over here. They're not even full sentences. They're just notes. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's funny that you say that because I've heard people talking about gluconeogenesis. And saying that we, we should just be eating enough carbs so our body doesn't have to do that because in order for the liver to make that glucose, it's too stressful for our liver to do that. And it's not good for the liver. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, are they are these the same people that tell you it's a good idea to go for a jog for half an hour, two or three times a week? <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> right, well, there, there's your answer then, isn't it? That shows exactly how much they understand about physiology because they've just contradicted themselves right there, haven't they? Oh, my word. Asking a existing metabolic pathway in the human body to do what it is designed to do and crafted to the absolute peak of evolution to do, because each one of us is the peak of evolution, aren't we? We, we are the end of the whole chain of events leading to your gene set. So it, you'd think it would be pretty optimal for, for wherever it started. Um, I guess that also kind of we get off into the into the wild theories now stuff like evolution and, and all of that kind of stuff that some people will still rail against me saying it's a thing mm. so our question? liver then no well i'm not sure so our liver is designed then to make glucose for our body that's one of and its, it's, yes that's one of the roles one the liver of its is functions designed. so yes so it's not stressful on it because it's part of its design that's what you're saying Right, it's normally okay. not necessarily everyday activity, you know. Well, it is for some people and should be. And it's something that the liver is designed to do and designed to cope with. Okay. So, I mean, to call it a huge stress, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. It's just doing what it's designed to do. Um, I want to talk for a minute about salt because lately when I first uh, started eating this way and, you know, people were talking about salt to taste and don't, you know, it's salt and blood pressure. That's not even related. Just eat, eat your salt mm. to taste. Um, but lately I've heard people talking about, but salt is addictive. Salt is addictive. Like sugar is addictive. Yeah. And so you should really stay away from salt. Uh, yeah. Personally, I eat salt. I eat it to taste. Um, I eat the salt. I like, I, you know, as, mm. as much as I want on my steak <laughs> till it, you know, stops tasting good. Yeah. But what do you what do you say to that salt as being addictive? 
I've never seen any evidence myself that it is or that it isn't to, when I think about it. It's not even something that this, to my knowledge, has been particularly considered in anything like any reputable literature. If, the, if there is anything there and I've missed it, let me know about it at some point. I might read it for a laugh. Um, I guess anything can become addictive to a person if they invest a lot in that behavior, whether that thing is or is not itself physically addictive. Well, things that are physically addictive have certain hallmarks, I guess. And among them would be a buildup over time on the use. So are you using more and more and more and more salt or is it the same amount? Given that your taste on the day by day will do that because that's the instinct you've got. Because your body knows how much salt it needs. So it tells your brain how much salt that you should. So you just, oh yeah. it's, that's what I do. It's just complete. I don't, I don't measure out salt or anything. Goodness. No, I don't think no. it's addictive. No. Okay. Yeah, I noticed usually it's about the same amount, but then there are some days, like if I eat some eggs or something, sometimes I just want them with no salt. Most of the time it sounds disgusting with no salt, but sometimes it's just like no salt today. <laughs> Your body knows. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, and then what about like iodized salt? Because they there are people that say, like, I don't I just listen to the people that said you need to go with some kind of mineral salt, like a Redmond real salt or a Himalayan pink salt or something like that. So I switched to that. Uh, what are your thoughts on the iodized salt? Well, to me, so long as you take care of the major electrolytes, then the minor players around that, that you may or may not be deriving from foods otherwise, plus or minus, and everyone's an expert in salt, aren't they? Mm -hmm. You've got all sorts of people saying all sorts of things, this brand, that brand, use this, don't use that, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've even got one guy that says salt is rock. <laughs> so, good. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, the, all, I, all I worry about personally is, okay, well, what are the most important electrolytes that you're going to get from salt? Sodium chloride and potassium so to get the balance of that right you'd put in two measures of table salt to one measure of whatever salt it is that you're going to get the potassium from probably no salt is a good is a some people call it new salt in you some people call it no salt potassium chloride is what it is and mix that in with the right amount of water, which would have you at around about maybe one teaspoon of table salt and half a teaspoon of the potassium salt in, I think it's two liters of water from memory. There are recipes online for snake juice. Yeah, I've seen them. I usually just salt my food. I don't usually put mm, me salt too. in my water. Yeah, you know? neither. Uh. Um, so when you mentioned electrolytes, it reminded me I was watching you recently on an interview and um, talking about people at night when we get sometimes leg cramps and things like that and talking about how just putting in more electrolytes is like, what did you say? It's like a bucket with holes in it and you just keep mm. putting water in to try to keep yeah. it full. Can yeah. you explain what you were talking about there? Because I'm someone who does do electrolytes. Like I buy the packets because if I don't do it, I do after a few days of not taking them. And mm. I haven't tried it recently because those leg cramps are no joke. Like it's in my calves and I'll just wake up and my whole calf will just cramp up. It's super painful. Mm. So is there something yeah. else I should be should be doing? Because I don't think I fully understood what mm. you meant. Yeah. Okay. So usually one of the first actual symptoms that you will be aware of yourself if there is an electrolyte leakage issue is going to be these leg cramps, mostly at night, mostly in the legs. It's magnesium is the issue on that one. So we can suggest that your everything else is okay, at least, because there are no other symptoms, like I presume you're not having huge heart palpitations or painting sessions or anything like that. So everything else sounds okay. So what we need to do is deal with the magnesium issue. Mm 
it might be a balance issue rather than a volume or mass issue of electrolytes. So we don't want to pour a bunch more sugar down, especially because the electrolyte leakage is probably caused um, by an artifact of insulin action on the renal tissues, the, the kidney tissues. So we need to close that up rather than pour more salt down. And that's what I was meaning with the bucket with the holes. Mm -hmm. If you want to collect water, you've got to cure the holes really at some point. So let's deal with the magnesium directly. So what you do is put magnesium salt of some kind in a water bottle, a spray bottle, and spray it directly on your skin. Okay. Mm. I have some lens, that I... It'll absorb it. And if it doesn't, it won't. I have... I have like a, a magnesium spray that I purchased and I just am lazy. Um, but is something like that that you purchase online, a magnesium spray that you can, is that, does that work sure. or do I need Should to? Do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to get less lazy and see if I can maybe stop uh, with the, with the electrolyte supplements then. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Uh, see how that goes. Um, well, I have one more, well, maybe two more topics, but um for sure, I want to get to grounding because firstly, when I heard about grounding, I thought, well, that's really woo-woo. That sounds really uh, yeah. <laughs> not like something I would do at all, um, yeah. kind of out there. But then I heard a video that you did about it, and I was like, all right. And so I went as far as to have my husband. We had taken all of our grass out because in Southern California, water is... Uh, for all intents and purposes, rationed. They know how many people live in your house. And then there's a certain amount you can get for a certain price. If you use over that, they charge you more, stuff mm. like that. And mm. so we took all the grass out, but I had him plant me a small patch of grass. Uh, and I know you don't have to have grass, but it's not comfortable just standing on the, on the, mm. the mulch and whatever else is out there. So yeah, he planted me a small patch of grass and I've been going out there and um, grounding mm -hmm. unless the bugs keep me away. But I can tell you that I feel when I when I go out there and do a session of grounding, I really feel better. And almost within a few seconds of getting on the grass and getting that electrical conductivity going, it's like I I feel calm. Not that I felt stressed before or anxious, but it just like I just feel like calm right away. And then I just really enjoy the whole time I'm standing out there, standing out there. So I would like you to tell us a little bit about that. But then also I heard somebody say, if you buy one of those grounding pad things that you plug into a wall, th that's a bad idea because it's going to pull the dirty electricity. I don't know what that means. I'm just quoting yeah. this person. Yeah. Dirty electricity from your house. Because yeah. I had, I've been thinking about purchasing one and maybe putting it in my bed or when I'm here working on YouTube stuff, you know, in my mm. office or whatever. And mm. using it, but I thought I'm going to ask about grounding in general, and then what is this dirty electricity business? Right. Okay. So grounding in general, when I first heard about it, I said, "For goodness' sake, I'm a scientist." That was my reaction. So, yep, yeah, the woo-woo thing. And then the mm -hmm. person that suggested it to me said, "Well, if you're a scientist, you'll check out if there's any science, then, won't you?" Good challenge. So I went, I went away, and I did that, and went, "Oh, yeah, okay, my bad. There is some science here." Among other things, grounding is associated with a normalization of brainwave activity from, I think it's alpha to delta from memory. It's the fight and flight to rest and recuperate change of brainwave activity. So that's probably what mm -hmm. you're feeling. Yeah. Oh, I'm quite relaxed now. Mm -hmm. You could probably be taken by an eagle. You wouldn't see it coming. We have oh, hawks here. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. There you go. Um among other things, people with abnormal or aberrant cortisol profiles tend to normalize when they ground. Wounds tend to heal more rapidly in both animal and human models. Okay, that's interesting. The thickness, the, the viscosity of a person's blood reduces by a factor of three immediately on grounding. So the heart has to work one third is hard to achieve the same circulation. That's probably a good thing. Sleep patterns are better. Bunch of other stuff that all, it's just in line with returning the physiology of a human body to its natural habitat, which was grounded to the earth. We've only insulated ourselves from the earth electrically in the last, well, 150 years, isn't it? 
So it's just returning that connection with the earth. And it seems to normalize a bunch of things. Who'd have thunk it? Hmm. That's all it is. Dirty electricity. Right. What is that? You've probably all seen those like six or eight electric wire carrying pylons that take electricity across the countryside, those massive, huge pylons, the major, the, the grid mm -hmm. supply lines. A lot of people don't understand that you can't turn one of those off to work on it while the other seven keep supplying. Well, you can, you can cut power to that line, but the power flowing through all the other lines induces a current in the line that's shut off from the power. So it's because of the electromagnetic field inducing a new current in the wire that's no longer receiving one. So it would get a proportion of the charge it would have carried where it turned on, but it would still be quite hot, thank you. Okay. So they have to bind onto that wire to repair it. Um, so that's kind of the analogy that would um, hopefully make some of that make some sense. So what we're saying is if you plug a grounding device into a three-pin socket, in the States, I believe you only have two pins anyway. No, um, we have but, three. I mean, we okay. have some, not all. I think all the ones in my house have three. I remember right. some, oh, yeah. when I was a kid, some were two, and then there was like a grounded one with three, like yep. in some of the places. Right. You know? Okay. So what, what you're basically doing is you're plugging into that grounding circuit on that plug. The other two okay. plugs on that plugging in are plastic plugs, no wires, nothing to nothing to carry back to you. But the proximity of the earth wire to live electrical impulses can induce a current in that wire, is the theory. Okay. I don't know whether it makes a hill of beans a difference, whether it's good for you, bad for you, or completely innocuous. And I don't think anybody else does either. Anyone that says they do is speculating. Um, and apparently this week, Jack Cruz had his YouTube channel taken down, by the way, just out of, yeah, bizarre. Anyway, um, yeah, so we're inducing a current potentially in the wire that's supposed to be acting solely as a connection to Earth. Don't know if it's a problem. I, I don't think so. Nonetheless, we're in a position where we live to be able to put a physical metal stake in the ground outside and earth off that to our earthing equipment. So that's what we do just because we can. Yeah, yeah. I mean, mm. I don't know if I could do – I would have to investigate that a lot more. So in your opinion, nobody really knows, and so it's just kind of up to me if I wanted to go and purchase one that I've yeah. plugged into a into a mm. outlet like that. Yep. I just thought, because I, like I said, when I go outside, if I, I do feel really great, but I can't just spend my all day mm. <laughs> standing out there looking at the sun as much as I, you know, would, would do enjoy that. Uh, I got things to do being a teacher mm. and a mom and all of that, you know? Um, mm. Okay. Interesting. Uh, lastly, just wanted to have a little bit of fun. Uh, you said in one of your recent videos that one of your favorite cuts of meat is picanha. And can I tell you, mm. I've been... It's, kind of uh in a funny way i guess dubbed the picanha president the picanha princess i love picanha yeah. so when i heard that was yeah. one of your favorite cuts i'm like i gotta ask bart k mm. about picanha because it wouldn't be a christy interview without it <laughs> awesome so yeah yeah so talk to me about picanha <laughs> right so what we normally do is get probably six of these at any one go and five will be frozen and one will be consumed over the next week. And then we mix it up with other stuff, sure, but that's basically how we do that. Basically, it goes straight out onto the barbecue where it's seared. And barbecue for Pim, my lovely Swedish partner, means an actual fire. None okay. of those gas, yeah. You know, so it's you're actually both cooking and kind of somewhat smoking it, and so it gets seared. Then it goes back inside, gets cut into steaks, and then those steaks are returned for searing on each side, leaving the middle as blue as possible. And we're into it with loads of butter and salt on top of that. 
nothing better. Oh man, that just sounds delicious. It seems it sounds like the picanhas where you are must be bigger than the ones that are cut here because when I buy a picanha at the store, now I haven't gone to the butcher and had them cut me one, so to be mm. fair. Mm. Um, and I also just ordered a half a cow and I have not, like it's in my freezer still. I haven't opened up that picanha, so I don't know how big that one is. But right. when I buy them just from the grocery store, they're like right around three pounds. They're not, they wouldn't last me a week. Right. Um, yeah, maybe the ones we were getting are bigger than that. I don't know. I didn't even. Yeah. I said, oh, yeah, good. <laughs> Lovely. Put those in the freezer, shall yeah. I? Right. What should yeah. I do next year? Mm. <laughs> Got yeah. it. Mm. Well, they are delicious. And I was making one a week until my son started eating carnivore back in February. And now he likes picanha just as much as his mom. And so, yeah, we, we go through awesome. quite a bit of it. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Um, yeah. His, his story is awesome. Uh, I guess maybe I had one more topic for you. He, he um, has ADHD and mm -hmm. we tried everything. I mean, everything in the conventional um, system, wisdom, conventional thought paths <laughs> to let's go with that. With that. Not wisdom. Yeah, through <laughs> it's, I don't think it's wisdom either through, mm -hmm. um, you know, the school, the outside occupational therapy, the counseling, the all this stuff through school, outside of school, all the way up through his pediatrician and medication. And not one of those things made any of his symptoms even a little bit better with the exception of the medication, but he felt horrible on it. He said it made him feel trapped in his own body. Like he still wanted mm -hmm. to move and he just like couldn't um, and he hated it. So that didn't last longer than a couple of months. And that was the last thing we tried. That was like the last, you know, cause we last dish effort, I guess I would say just because he was not able to be, you know, successful with things like, you know, school and mm -hmm. um, organizing tasks and, he had, um, similar to you, that the uh, demand, I forget how you phrased it over here, we call it ODD, oppositional defiance. <laughs> uh, but the like task I'll, I'll take demand that. avoidance, the, the task yes. avoidance <laughs> thing. Yeah, well, it, it, it a, expresses a, that way too, yeah. Mm -hmm, a hardcore mm. case of that when it came to parents, teachers, anybody. And um, I don't know about himself, because you've often said, even if you yourself tell yourself to do it, you're not going to do it. Um, no. I'm not doing that because yeah, you no, said so. Yeah, no, not doing that because you <laughs> said so, yeah. Uh, but man, mm. he went carnivore in February and um, has really, the first thing he did was just decide to clean his room all on his own. And he was able to look at that task, chunk it up into sections and do it without anyone telling him just of his own will to do it and, you know, the organization of his mind to do it, which was just unheard of. Um, and his negative attitude has gotten so much better. He's more on time for school. Um, he doesn't have meltdowns anymore. It's, it's pretty amazing. But a lot of times when I talk about it, I get comments on my channel that just say like one word, usually misinformation, things like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts about the carnivore diet and how it can help with things like ADHD? Well, I don't know about misinformation, but I, I am Mr. Information. I'm the science. Trust me, I'm safe and effective. Me. <laughs> don't question the science. Um, it's one of those tapestries that's going to be real interesting to try and unpack cause and effect. So again, I can offer you a theory. Theory is that a species-appropriate, species-specific hypercarnivore diet is the diet most likely to lead a person to their lowest basal inflammatory overburden status. And we know that the signs, symptoms, the pointers to these kind of, I'm not even going to call them disorders, these kind of presentations that people have, mm -hmm. we know that that is reduced when they are minimally inflamed so i would suspect that that's the connection yeah yeah i would tend to agree and i like the word you said reduce because i'm not saying he's cured i'm not saying he's you know it's 100 percent perfect and now he's just does all of his homework magically that's not happening mm. um but i will say that it's made our household a, a much more peaceful place to be um because the whole dynamic of the family and like everyday life can just move forward without somebody just like bucking and kicking and digging their heels in the mm. entire time, you know? Yeah. 
Um, mm. There's just been an. I should put you in touch with my mum. You guys could commiserate. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Well, um, on that end, on that lovely note, Bart K, thank you so much for coming on and chatting with me today and for answering the questions that I didn't have the answers to um, on my YouTube channel when people ask them. I appreciate you and your time today so much. So thank you. My pleasure. Bye, everybody. <laughs>